You're ready to take the next step to becoming a legend. Then bring me this, and do not waver no matter how daunting the task. Throughout the years, the developers at Square have never been shy about including references to pop culture in Final Fantasy games. Often, these were meant as odes to entertainment properties the developers were influenced by or that they simply enjoyed, and their placement has always been pretty intentional and with meaning, even if that meaning has sometimes been changed in localization. These references have related to numerous properties, such as The Legend of Zelda, which was referenced in the Japanese version of Final Fantasy 1 on the Famicom, and Dragon Quest, which was referenced within the same reference as it was changed for its release in North America. But they have often extended outside of video games too, with numerous tributes paid to historical figures, anime properties, and of course, movies. And when it comes to movies, around the time that Final Fantasy was being created, there was nothing bigger than Star Wars. The first three movies grossed almost $2 billion worldwide, and it currently stands as the 8th highest grossing movie franchise of all time in Japan. Such has been its impact that Star Wars has served as heavy inspiration for a lot of entertainment creators over the years. Ridley Scott, for example, has spoken about how it inspired the creation of Alien, and Katsuhiro Otomo, the creator of Akira, has also stated that Star Wars was his main influence throughout production, which is interesting because that influence then went full circle, as Akira then served as an inspiration for George Lucas when he was looking to create the Clone Wars. It comes as no surprise then that Final Fantasy has also been influenced by Star Wars. This has manifested in some pretty obvious ways, such as a nod to the two pilots from Red Squadron called Biggs and Wedge, who have appeared in pretty much every single Final Fantasy game since Final Fantasy VI. But there are also plenty of other more obscure Star Wars references that have been present throughout the years, and as we go through this video, we're going to ease into varying levels of obscurity, although we're pretty confident that the final reference will blow your mind. Perhaps the best place to start though is building upon the inclusion of Biggs and Wedge, as there have been many other characters in Final Fantasy that have had their names influenced by characters who also appeared in Star Wars, and one of the more interesting ones appeared in Final Fantasy VII. In this particular game, Biggs and Wedge had perhaps their most prominent role, but another name illusion was hidden in plain sight, and it belonged to one of the playable cast. Red 13 is one of the most interesting members of the cast due to his appearance and backstory. This led to him having two names, as Red 13 was the name given to him by Professor Hojo for the purpose of specimen identification. His real name though was Nanaki, but this was an anagram, as by moving the N from the front to the back, it would spell Anakin. Prior to the release of The Phantom Menace, this name served as a very subtle nod to one Anakin Skywalker, who was only ever mentioned once in the original pre-remastered trilogy during Return of the Jedi. But Red 13's connection with Star Wars goes much deeper than the name anagram. Anakin Skywalker also had two names, with the other being Darth Vader, and this was a name that was assigned to him by someone else. The name Red 13 itself could also be an allusion to the same Red Squadron that Biggs and Wedge hailed from. In the original movies, their call signs were Red plus their associated number. For example, Biggs was Red 3 and Wedge was Red 2, and during the Battle of Yavin, there were 12 members of the squadron, so Red 13 could be a nice allusion to him being an honorary member of the squad. But outside of Red 13, many other games have also featured some subtle references when it comes to character names, and in addition to Biggs and Wedge, Final Fantasy VIII featured quite a few. The first of which was Nida. This character was named as such as a nod to Lorth Nida, the unfortunate lieutenant commander who lost the Millennium Falcon and was then choked to death by Darth Vader. In Final Fantasy VIII, Nida passed the seed exam at the beginning of the game alongside Squall, Selfie and Zell, and later became the pilot of Balam Garden. Piet, the head researcher of the Lunar Base, was also Star Wars inspired, his name was a nod to another Imperial officer called Admiral Firmus Piet, who ended up commanding Darth Vader's flagship, the Executor. The most subtle nod though was Martin, the headmaster of Galbadia Garden. But this tribute did not translate through to the English or French versions of the game. In the Japanese version, Martin was instead called Dodonna, and this was also the case in the Spanish, German and Italian versions of Final Fantasy VIII, and this served as a tribute to Jan Dodonna from the Rebel Alliance. But as we're talking about obscure in this video, 
we have to mention before Crisis. Within this game, there were three ravens called Tyrus, Kanos, and Kainu, or however you're meant to pronounce that. They were loyal servants of Fajito, and they were also named after three characters in Star Wars who paralleled their roles. Grodin Tyrus was first introduced via a novel called Spectre of the Past, Min Kaino featured within Return of the Jedi, and Kir Kanos was first introduced in a six-part comic series called Crimson Empire. The connection was that they were all part of the Emperor's Royal Guard, serving the Emperor in their crimson red outfits, much as they also served as Fajito's elite guard in Before Crisis. Within Final Fantasy IX, we got to see Odes to Star Wars appear within the script, in addition to the names of the characters. This particular game featured some fantastic scenes, and along with the amazing score by Nobuo Uematsu, dialogue was central to their impact. This was overseen by Kazuhiko Aoki and his team of event planners, and in some of the more pivotal moments, they used the dialogue to emphasize certain themes. The final showdown with Necron was a pivotal moment in this regard, as after each of the main cast finding out what it meant to live, the party were confronted with a being who spoke about how futile it was to live when death was the only inevitability. According to a fan translation, in the Japanese version, Necron stated that life was constantly wrapped in anxiety, in suffering, in the fear that someday it will die. When it came to the English localization, someone decided they would have a bit of fun, as after seeing similarities, they adjusted the Japanese version to read instead as a direct reference to a line that Yoda had used in The Phantom Menace. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. But that wasn't the only line to get a similar treatment. Kuja also made reference to Star Wars when he noted that everything is proceeding as I have foreseen, a line that was used by Emperor Palpatine during Return of the Jedi. And even though it's not Star Wars related, just to show how much fun the localization team had, the famed line that was spoken during I Want to Be Your Canary, No Cloud, No Squall Shall Hinder Me, had no reference to protagonist from the prior games in the Japanese version. Via Legends of Localization, the Japanese line instead read, of course, even should it rain or storm. But Final Fantasy IX was not the only game in the franchise to follow a similar approach when it came to quoting Star Wars. Final Fantasy VI, for example, made reference to Princess Leia's cheeky line to Luke Skywalker about looking too short to be a stormtrooper, and Final Fantasy VII had Cloud say, I've got a bad feeling about this, which has become a running gag within Star Wars, having appeared in almost all of the movies. For our third theme of Star Wars reference, we're going to be taking a look at one of the pivotal story moments within Final Fantasy IV. Cecil was introduced as a Dark Knight, who served the Kingdom of Baron as the leader of the formidable Red Wings, which it's believed were named as such as another reference to Red Squadron. We learned that Cecil led the Red Wings with a high degree of professionalism, but after his father's orders started to lose their noble motivations, Cecil questioned his path and ended up renouncing his loyalty to the King. Desperate to make amends for his previous actions, Cecil attempted to rise up against his former charges, but after being accosted by Leviathan, he washed up alone on the shores of Mycidia. The Mycidians had little sympathy for Cecil, but they pointed him to a place called Mount Ordeals where he would be able to renounce his dark, evil ways and become a true beacon of light. This then manifested in a duel where Cecil would need to square off against his dark past in one-on-one -on -one combat so that he could become a warrior of the light, something which bore a striking resemblance to the conclusion of Luke Skywalker's journey to Dagobah in The Empire Strikes Back. During this sequence, Luke was also instructed by an elder statesman, Yoda, to venture into a cave to face a trial without knowing what specifically he might find inside. He then squared off against his dark side in a duel, and although the method of victory differed, both Cecil and Luke defeated their dark sides and pledged to become beacons of the light from that moment on. Perhaps the most obvious connection between Star Wars and Final Fantasy IV though comes with Golbez and Darth Vader. Like Darth Vader, Golbez had a strong affinity with magic, wore heavy dark armor, and served the game's big bad. But he also changed his name after traumatic events led him to turn evil, and he revealed his relationship to Cecil before turning back to the side of good and attempting to defeat his former master. In the remade versions of Final Fantasy IV, Golbez was even given a voice similar to Darth Vader, just to make the connection a little bit clearer. But the obscure reference for Golbez comes within Dissidia Duodecim. 
Within this game, Golbez has a sequence with the Emperor from Final Fantasy II, and the setting and dynamic feels very similar to encounters that the Emperor had with Darth Vader in his throne room. But Golbez was not the only character to share similarities with Darth Vader. In Final Fantasy II, Leon was initially an ally and was a blood relative of Maria, but he ended up being brainwashed by the Emperor and became a dark armoured enforcer for the Empire known as the Dark Knight. He too also had an affinity with magic, and he could use it to control people's minds, as shown by his occupation of the town of Bafsk, where the citizens were all mute, nullified by his power. When his role was revealed, Leon then attempted to take the place of the Emperor, using similar logic to that of Darth Vader, but he then chose to defect and turn against his former master. Final Fantasy IV also introduced another reference that would appear in a few other iterations of Final Fantasy, and that came via airships. Even though airships had featured since the original Final Fantasy, it wasn't until Final Fantasy III that they received specific names outside of being simply called Sid's Airship. In Final Fantasy III, the three purpose-named airships outside of Sid's Airship were the Invincible, the Nautilus, and the Enterprise, although it's unclear whether this was a reference to the traditional nautical name used by the United States Navy, or the one famed for its prominent role in the lore of Star Trek. Within Final Fantasy IV, that association became a bit more clear, as the two main airships were called the Enterprise and the Falcon. This then positioned the Enterprise as a clear reference to Star Trek, and the Falcon as a clear reference to Star Wars, as it was a shortened version of the Millennium Falcon. The Falcon then resurfaced within Final Fantasy VI, where it was classified as the fastest airship in the world by Setzer, referencing the similar statement made by Han Solo about the Millennium Falcon. And on that subject, Setsa also mirrors the role of Lando Calrissian. Not only is he a keen gambler, but he also states the Empire has made him a rich man. Lando was of course also the original owner of the Millennium Falcon before he lost it in a bet to Han Solo. Perhaps one of the strangest references to Star Wars though has appeared in one of the most recent installments, Final Fantasy XV. This game was packed full of references to other Final Fantasy games, as well as classical literature, prominent TV shows and prominent moments throughout the history of cinema and they appeared in numerous ways, from witty banter delivered by Prompto or via quest names. But perhaps one of the most interesting came from a modern take on a classic enemy, the Tonbury. Final Fantasy XV featured three types of Tonbury. There was the basic version that was very common throughout Eos and was very faithful to what had come before. There was the Master Tonbury, which served as a reference to a more extreme variant that first appeared within Final Fantasy VI and then reappeared within Final Fantasy VII. And then there was the Sir Tonbury, or Tonbury Knight in the Japanese version, and this was a unique variant that was unlike anything seen before within the franchise. Sir Tonbury was classified as a demonic subspecies of Tonbury that wielded its knife with the ferocity of a master, and this meant their fighting style was nothing like the traditional Tonbury, who were known for being slow, methodical, and brutal. Instead, Sir Tonbury would move around the battlefield with lightning speed, adopting a very aggressive stance that would see their knives leave trails in the sky due to their velocity. This made any fight against Sir Tonbury rather taxing, and the hunt called Legend Wrapped in Enigma was one of the most difficult available. It made for a rather unorthodox appearance for the Tonbury, but it was an intentional move as it was done to make reference to Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. Within these movies, we got to see Yoda, who would often be walking around acting like he had severe arthritis, leap around the battlefield with extreme agility when he squared off against Count Dooku and later Darth Sidious, and both of these scenarios ended up being rather surprising, just like seeing Sir Tonbury for the first time. And that leads us onto our final obscure reference, which we promised would blow your mind. We mentioned earlier that Final Fantasy VIII featured numerous references to characters within Star Wars, and in this regard, Final Fantasy VIII features more references to Star Wars characters than any other game in the franchise. But the connection between the two entertainment powerhouses goes much deeper than that within this particular property, as a huge segment of the game was based around a very niche part of the expanded Star Wars universe. Within the context of the game's lore, there is a phenomenon known as the Lunar Cry. This would see a gravitational corridor created between the planet and its orbiting moon that would then allow the many monsters who sensed the coming of this event and lived on the moon to travel to the planet and wreak havoc. It's said that this phenomenon was what wiped out the Cetra, and Esther had developed a technology under the rule of Sorceress Adele called the Lunatic Pandora that could initiate the Lunar Cry on a location of their choice. 
a true weapon of mass destruction. It was a fantastical event, unlike anything seen before within the franchise, but what's interesting is that it was based off of a very similar occurrence within the lore of Star Wars. Back in 1993, Dark Horse Comics published the first part in a lengthy comic book saga. It was called Tales of the Jedi, and the first edition was called Ulic Keldroma and the Beast Wars of Onderon Part 1. This introduced a new planet named Onderon and an orbiting moon called Duxin. Thanks to Jedi Master Arca Jeth, we learned that from a lore perspective, there was a specific mechanic that existed between Onderon and Duxin. As Duxin orbited so close to the planet, sometimes their atmospheres would mix together and create a tunnel of air between the two. This would allow the vicious Drexel beasts that resided on Duxin to take advantage of this unique corridor and they could then migrate down to the planet and terrorize the natives. Even though the conclusion was different in these two scenarios, the literal occurrence of the event had very clear parallels to what was seen within Final Fantasy VIII and it comes from a very specific source within the Star Wars universe. Following the conclusion of the comic book series, Onderon has also been featured within Knights of the Old Republic, The Old Republic and The Clone Wars, but this connection with Final Fantasy feels pretty special and much more unique than any of the others featured on this list. But with that, I think we're done. They were 7 obscure Star Wars references that have appeared throughout the Final Fantasy franchise with plenty of others thrown in for good measure. How many of them did you already know about? Let us know in the comments below and please share which one you found to be the most interesting. And of course, if you enjoyed the video then please hit that like button, share it around and subscribe to our channel because I'm excited to share that our next video should be our reveal of the Final Fantasy VII Remake survey results. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. A big thanks to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters and of course, a big thanks to all of you for watching this video. I hope to see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.